Welcome. Uh, my name is Sid. I'm a solutions architect with AWS. I've been with AWS for around four and a half years now, and I'm joined by my colleague. Hi, I'm Kuba Wojciak. I'm a principal engineer in AWS, where I work uh, with uh, Simple Queue Service, Simple Notification Service, Amazon MQ, and also Step Functions and Simple Workflow. And I've been with AWS for three and a half years now. And today, we're going to talk about messaging. The importance of messaging uh, in your software solutions, uh, different use cases and how they map to different messaging services we have in the cloud. And we're also going to uh, see some demos on how those messaging services work. Let's start with a bold statement that my colleague Tim Bray made. So from our experience, these are the three things that uh, move you towards messaging, being cloud native, being large scale distributed. And not having messaging in these cases uh, seems like a bug in your architecture. And it makes sense when you think about it. When you used to have a big monolith application, all the communication happened internally, and you didn't need an extra component for that. And as you move towards microservices, uh, there are new communication paths, um, which now you, uh, messaging can fill very well and solve uh, the problem of communication between components for you. So we like to think about messaging as the fourth pillar on which you build your mobile, uh, modern applications. Let's talk about some basics. In messaging, we deal with passing messages around. The systems that send messages will typically be called um, message producers. The systems that consume these messages and work on them uh, are message consumers. And what is passed around are messages. So what are messages? Well, it's whatever you want to send between two systems. Here's an example of a, of a message explaining a hotel booking in a hotel booking system. Um, and the developers chose JSON as the format for messages. You can pass the same amount of information using whatever format you would like. And here's the same message described in XML. And when you send messages around, it's up to the producer and consumer service to establish what the format will be and what the contents of the messages are. But you also can send attributes along with your messages. And attributes are just key values of whatever you want to attach to your message. They can have a business meaning. They can have some technical meaning. So you may ask yourself a question, for this particular piece of data, where should I put it? Should it go into the payload? or should I attach it as an attribute to the message? And the answer for that one is the payload can get encrypted. The attributes are never encrypted. The attribute can be used for filtering messages out, for routing them between your services. So looking at a particular piece of information, this is like the distinction you can make. Does it go into attributes or goes into the message payload? And in AWS, we have a bunch of systems and services for uh, providing messaging services to you. Uh, we've got SQS for queues. We've got SNS for topics. We've got Kinesis for data streams. And last year at Re reInvent, we've launched Amazon MQ. And Amazon MQ is a hosted active MQ broker. And we're not going to talk about Amazon MQ in this session because the purpose of Amazon MQ is to enable you to move your existing software into the cloud, to move your existing software that talks to some on-premise broker and basically point it towards a hosted ActiveMQ instance in the cloud. In this talk, we're going to focus on uh, messaging um, services provided by SQS, SNS, and Kinesis. And I'm going to hand it over to Sid to talk about customer use cases for messaging. Thanks, Kuba. So we'll talk about four customers. We'll look at their use cases, why they needed a messaging platform to begin with, what their requirements were. We'll look at which AWS service fits their requirements, and finally bring it all together by looking at their actual architecture. 
These are real customer use cases and real architectures. Who here has shopped groceries from Amazon Fresh? A raise of hands? Wow, that's less than what I expected. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Amazon Fresh is a grocery delivery service in select cities in the United States. Now, if you go and look at the Amazon Fresh website, you'll realize that the products vary based on which city you are in. And that's because customers like locally sourced fresh products and products which are in season, which means the Amazon Fresh team has to continuously update their catalog based on customer feedback. So for that, they build a product selection portal. And the idea is a selection manager browses through this portal on a daily basis and makes changes. Now, from an architecture standpoint, any change made to their portal has to be automatically pushed to a retail and purchase system which would restock inventory. Now, what better way to decouple or connect two loosely, loosely coupled systems than to use a messaging platform? Now, let's look at what requirements they had. They wanted a durable, persistent, and a highly available system. The system should scale. So whether you're sending one message or one million messages, you don't, you don't have to care about that. Let the messaging platform handle that. Lastly, it should be easy to manage. All this feature should not come at the cost of complexity. So I'll let Kuba talk to us on what's the right messaging platform in this use case. Thanks. Let's talk about Amazon SQS standard queues. They've been on, uh, available in AWS since AWS launch, really. Um, in the middle, you can see how you should think about an SQS standard queue. It's a collection of messages, kind of ordered, but not really. Uh, on the left-hand side, you're going to see producers that will send messages into the queue. And on the right-hand side, you will see consumers consuming from this queue. And Let's see how a standard SQS queue behaves when you start sending messages to it and receiving from it to understand how it behaves for your service. So let's say the first producer attempts to send message A into the queue, calls send message on SQS. And SQS stores the message durably, multiple copies that you don't really see when you're going to start receiving the message. But when you see an OK response from SQS, you can be sure that the message is not lost, like it's stored in multiple copies across availability zones. What happens when another producer sends a message B into the queue? Call send message. Now, in this scenario, let's imagine that there was some kind of a networking problem when the second producer was calling send message. SQS saw the call and stored the message durably, but the producer saw some kind of a socket timeout. He kind of doesn't know whether SQS got the message or didn't. So what the producer will do is he'll retry the send. And because of that retry, SQS standard cannot actually detect that it's a duplicate message. It will store another copy for you. So that's one of the reasons why you can see sometimes duplicates in a standard SQS queue. It's enough that the sender retries because it's some connectivity issue. So let's see how a standard queue behaves when you want to consume messages from it. Now, one of the most important features is SQS is the first S in the name, simple. When you want to consume messages, the only thing you need to do is to call receive message and provide the queue URL. You don't get to tell SQS which message you want to receive is the responsibility of SQS to select the next best message to give out to you. So the first consumer calls receive message. And SQS selects the message to return and hands it back to the consumer. And the consumer can start working on it. Now, notice that the message is still in the queue. It's not immediately removed. It's invisible. And you, you can control the invisibility timeout. And this invisibility timeout makes sure that if another consumer wants to fetch another message, SQS won't give out this 
particular message because someone is already working on it. So the second consumer calls Rishi's message, and for the second one, SQ has decided to give out this other message, and again, start the invisibility timeout. What happens when you successfully process the message? So the first consumer is done with the message. He's now supposed to call delete message on, this, on the message handle that he got, which actually causes the removal of the message from the queue. So only when the consumer acknowledges that he successfully processed the message and calls the delete message, the message is gone. This guarantees that you will process the message at least once. You will always get it. So what happens when a consumer has a problem consuming the message. He cannot understand the message. There's a code back. Something is wrong. The easiest solution for the consumer is just to forget about the message and do nothing. Doesn't even need to tell SQ as anything. Um, it can be just a, an exception in your code, or maybe the machine just fried and stopped processing anything. What happens next is the invisibility timeout on the message that he was working on expires. And the message is available for consumption again. Um, let me illustrate this behavior using a pre-recorded demo that I've prepared. Um, and just so it's like visible what's happening in the queue, the demo has a lot of thread.sleep in it. So it's running way slower than the actual service does. So in the middle, we have the queue. We're going to start a program to, uh, to query the contents of the queue. And we can see that currently the queue has no messages in it. On the right-hand side, we have a first consumer started. And since there are no messages, he's not receiving any messages yet from the queue. We start another consumer. So we have both consumers that try to pull for the next message from the queue. Let's start the producer. We're gonna, this one will send messages labeled A. So he's sending sequential messages. And on the right-hand side, you can see how both consumers in parallel are just grabbing the next available message. There's no coordination. The processing happens out of order. Let's start sending messages labeled B. So now you see how both consumers just compete over any available message next from the backlog. There's no ordering happening. The numbers go up and down. They just, it's a bag of messages that is an SQSQ. What's nice about it is when you start the third consumer or any number of consumers, you just increase the throughput of consumers. It's super elastic. So now we have three just competing over available backlog. Let's add a third producer into the mix. And immediately you see how all the three consumers are just processing through the backlog. And it's important to note here that the number of producers you can have in an SQS standard queue, the number of consumers you can have, the number of messages you can send through a queue is close to well, unlimited. You don't have to pre-provision anything. Anything you throw at an SQS standard queue, the queue will gladly accept and serve you. So it's very elastic and allows you to scale. But that comes at a specific cost. And the cost is sometimes you will most likely get messages out of order. You will get sometimes duplicate messages. So let's hear from Sid how the customer used an SQS standard queue and how they solved the problem of duplicates and message reordering. So Amazon Fresh decided to use SQSQ. Now, one key thing to understand is that every message is independent and self-contained. It contains the product ID, in this case, milk, and how much inventory has to be stocked up. So let's come to the two characteristics Kuba mentioned, which is out-of-order messages. So in this case, let's say there was a second message, which was for restocking up some candies. And now the message is flipped, and you got the milk message first. That's not a problem, because each message is self-contained. If we restock up the milk before candies, I don't think anybody complains, except maybe the kids. Now the second attribute, 
duplicates. So let's say we got the candy message twice. That's not a problem. 12,000 candies is anyways better than 6,000 candies. Problem solved. No, I'm just kidding. So the way the consumer tackles this problem is by keeping a timestamp of the last, a record of the last seen timestamp for a given product ID. And it discards any message it receives with a timestamp, which is a duplicate or an older one. Now let's look at the complete architecture. For the product selection portal, they went completely serverless. They hosted their website on S3 using the S3 starting host, static hosting website. They were using client-side scripting, like JavaScript, to make API calls to API Gateway, which would in turn launch Lambda functions, and this would dynamically update their website. They were storing their product catalog on RDS, and any change made to RDS would, would eventually trigger or immediately trigger a Lambda function, which would then write the message to the SQS queue. Let's talk about our second use case, Comcast. Comcast is a global telecommunications corporation. Many of us have Comcast Xfinity devices, which provide internet and television to our homes. Their use case involved a CRM data management system. A bunch of customer changes. For example, a customer requests a new internet connection. They buy a new internet modem. A work order is generated for an engineer to go and install the internet service. So all of those changes are being absorbed by Comcast. And then they have to be processed by a target CRM system. But they wanted to store all these messages in a message platform, in a message queue, which were pending and still had to be processed. So let's look at some of the requirements. Oh, yeah. So they required in-order processing for a given customer ID. So we had to make sure that the customer messages were processed in order. Secondly, for distributed processing, multiple customer messages can be processed parallelly. So they can have thousands of customer messages coming in for different customer IDs, and they are all processed by parallel threads. And they also required only once processing of a change. Now all that translates to these requirements on a messaging platform. Durable, scalable, persistent, that's given and expected. But in addition, we needed first in, first out kind of functionality. And we cannot have message duplicates. Now I'll hand it over to Kuba to explain which AWS service they went with. Thanks. So here we're going to talk about a new type of queue that was introduced in SQS two years ago, SQS 5 for queues. And immediately looking at the image, you can see the difference. The messages are ordered. But it's not just one sequence of ordered messages. In this image, we see three. And it's exactly to solve this particular use case where you don't really need strict ordering of everything in your system, because that would limit your scalability. To process things in a single sequence, you can have just one consumer working on them. Uh, typically, what you need is you need to process things in sequence for a specific subgroup of messages, like a customer account ID. But you want to work on multiple accounts in parallel. So let's see how SQS FIFO does it. Let's again, start, let's again start with producers. So now the first producer wants to send a message. To send a message to a FIFO queue, the producer needs to tell us what is the message group for which the message belongs to. Now, what's nice about it is just a string tag you put on a message. You don't have to pre-create this group. You can send as many as you like. There's no limitation, and you don't need to explicitly create them. It's just a tag on a message. So the producer calls send message on SQS FIFO, and SQS FIFO stores it in an ordered way to the particular group. And again, message is stored durably with multiple copies across AZs. You don't see that, but like once you see an OK from us, the message is persisted durably. What happens when the second producer sends a message, this time to group G3? Similar case. 
network broke. We have a socket timeout on the producer. SQS saw the send call, appended the message to appropriate group, but the producer doesn't know that, so he retries. Now, the case with SQS 5 OQs is that it keeps track of the last five minutes of all the identifiers of the messages you sent to it, even if they were consumed already. And it's able to detect that this is a retried send for the same message B that goes into the queue. So in SQS 5 OK, no duplicate is introduced. We just return an OK to the producer because we already have that message. As long as you retry within five minutes, you're good. No duplicate appears in the queue. OK, so now we saw how messages are sent to FIFO. Let's see how the consumers now use a FIFO queue. Like with standard queues, it's very simple. You just call receive message on an SQS FIFO queue. You don't get to tell which message you want to receive. You cannot even say which group you want to receive from. It's the responsibility of the SQS 5 OQ to pick, to pick the next best message for you to work on. So the first consumer calls receive, and 5 decides to hand out message from group G1 for him to, to consume. And C starts working on it. Like in SQS standard queues, the message is still there in the queue. It's invisible. But there's one extra change. If this message is being worked on from group G1, no other consumer can receive any other messages from G1. This is how we preserve the ordering of messages within a group. The entire group is kind of locked for you until the first consumer is done with the first message. So when another consumer calls receive message on an SQS FIFO, SQS FIFO can decide, oh, I'm going to give you the first message from group G3 to work on, so you can start working on it. What happens when you successfully process a message? Like in SQS standard, you're supposed to call delete message to acknowledge that you're done with it, which removes the message from the, from the queue. And at that point, it unblocks further processing of group G1. Another consumer can receive next message. So if the third consumer calls receive message, he may be the one getting next the second message from group G1. So it's important to know that you're still processing messages strictly ordered. There's no out of order processing happening. But you don't have any sort of guarantees who's going to get the next message for a particular group. All of your consumers can get message from any available group. So you don't have any type of consumer affinity. What happens when you fail to process a message? Similar to SQS standard, you can just forget about this message. Don't keep track of it. And when the invisibility timeout on the message expires, the group is available for consumption again. So let's see how this all works in a demo, again, with pauses introduced, so we can see what's happening. So like previously, in the, in the middle, we have the queue itself. And it's empty. Let's start the first consumer. And the only thing we need to tell the consumer is just the identifier of the queue. Start another consumer. Queue is empty, so obviously they don't get any messages yet. But now the interesting part starts. Let's start the producer sending messages labeled A into the queue. So both consumers are always polling for messages, but you, as you can see immediately, only one of them is working on the next available message from the queue. When we start another producer sending messages labeled B, now we have a situation where both consumers are able to work on something because there are two groups to, that can be worked on. And the, who works on which group can actually dynamically change. If we start a third consumer, he will do some useful work. But because, because on, we only have two message groups in the queue, only two out of three are actually doing anything in order to preserve uh, ordering. So 
So if you start as third producer, sending messages with the label C, we now have three groups, so three consumers can do useful work. But again, there's no affinity, and you can see how like, the ownership of who's working on next changes dynamically. What this means is it's very elastic when it comes to adding more consumers. Mm. In, a, in a typical use case where the messages describe changes to a customer account, um, you have preserved order, but you can work on millions of different uh, users and keep throwing more consumers at the FIFO queue. There is a limitation, though. A single FIFO queue has a limited throughput. The max it can uh, get to is 300 of each of send, receive, and delete per second. So with batching, you can get up to 3,000 messages per second. And let's hear from Sid how the customer utilized message groups and how they worked around this limitation of the throughput of a single FIFO queue. All right, so let's plug in SQS FIFO into the architecture. Now, what Comcast did was all messages for a given customer account number was sent to a different message group inside an SQS FIFO queue. Additionally, they were able to use multiple SQS FIFO queues to get very high throughput, and they did this by sharding customer account numbers across multiple message groups over different SQS FIFO queues. And they kept a mapping of which account number belongs to which message group in which SQS FIFO queue in a DynamoDB database. Let's talk about our next use case. Okta is an integrated identity and mobility management service. It lets users access their applications from anywhere, any place, anytime, securely by using services like single sign-on. Okta captures a bunch of events. These are user events like authentication, single sign-on, et cetera. And they want to use these events to perform streaming analysis to create real-time dashboards as well as batch analysis. Now, they wanted to use a messaging platform which would store all of this event data, and then the Apache Storm computational platform would read from this messaging queue and perform sliding window analysis. From a requirement standpoint, again, durable, scalable, persistent. But there's a key difference here. Every message is not independent. They wanted the ability to go back and look at a bunch of messages to do analysis and detect anomalies and create alerts. So they wanted some kind of a message replay to go back in time and look at them and do streaming analysis. So I'll let Kuba talk about the AWS service for this use case. So here we can see a Kinesis data stream. And at the first glance, it looks kind of exactly like an SQS 5 for Q. But we'll see the differences as we go along through how you send and receive from a Kinesis data stream. So again, you have in here. So let me take a step back and say, for data streaming, typically a different vocabulary is used. And when you talk about sending things into a data stream, you typically talk about putting records into a data stream. And you talk about reading the stream uh, the back. And what we see here is two shards, where each shard has a provisioned throughput. So you can expect certain megabytes per second and records per second from a shard. And you can create as many shards as you need when you work with the Kinesis data stream. But shards need to be pre-created. They are not created for you dynamically. And you basically have to say, I want 10 shards, 12 shards. Um, so let's see how this works, again, thro going through the cases of sending and consuming. The first producer wants to send message A. And in order for Kinesis data stream to select which shard should be used, you tag your message with something called the partition key. 
which is very similar to the message group identifier in FIFO. It's just a string. The partition key is not something you need to pre-create. It's just a string you tag your message uh, with. So the producer calls put record. And now Kinesis looks at what was supplied and needs to decide to which of these shards this new record should be appended to. And the way it's done is it's through hashing. So imagine a hashing algorithm which, as output, gives you a number. What happens here is each shard owns a subset of those hash keys. So we now know, see how the first shard has the first half of hash space and the second shard has the second half of hash space. What Kinesis now does is calculates the hash key for your particular partition key. So P2 maps to this value, which now clearly means that this record should be appended to the first shard. And again, when it's appended, it's stored in multiple copies durably across availability zones. When you see an OK, the message is good. Like it's not going to get lost. And at that point, we can return OK back to the producer. So like in previous examples, let's see what happens when B sends a payload, sends a record into a Kinesis data stream. We go through the same steps, calculate the hash value. This time, the partition key maps to a different value because it's a different partition key. And it ends up going to the second shard. Again, stored durably. And like in previous examples, what happens if there was a networking problem between the producer and Kinesis data stream when the call was made? The second producer will retry the call. And in case of Kinesis data streams, what's going to happen is the result of the hashing function is going to be the same value. So yes, there will be a duplicate, but it's always going to go to the same shard as the previous version. So when you start thinking about consuming data from a stream, it's easier to reason about how can I detect duplicates when I'm reading back the data. It's always going to the same shard. So I mentioned how you can have as many shards as you want, and each shard has a limited throughput. Um, what happens when you need more and you already had data in your Kinesis data stream? What happens is you can, what, you can do what is called a shard split. So you're basically selecting one of these and making two out of them. So you divide the existing hash space for a particular shard into two shards with a subset of keys. And that's how you can scale the throughput of a Kinesis data stream, again, almost infinitely by adding as many shards as you would like. So resharding means it doesn't influence existing data. The moment you do the resharding, um, New shards appear, and new data gets appended to the new shards. And there is a new easy-to-work-with API now where you can just say, for this particular Kinesis data stream, I just want that many shards. You don't have to pick specifically which shards you want to split and how. So let's talk about consuming from a Kinesis data stream. So the key difference here will be Remember how in like SQS, the only thing you needed to do was to call receive message and provide the queue URL, and the rest was on SQS. With Kinesis data streams, the responsibility of selecting from which shard you're reading and which record you're reading is on consumers. This is your code that needs to do this. So in order for the consumer to start reading from it, it first needs to query Kinesis, what are the available shards, pick a shard, and start reading from it using an iterator, something that resembles something like that. So you immediately see another key difference. You get consumer affinity. All the sequential entries in a shard end up always being read by the consumer that is reading from it. So it's easy to perform analysis of consecutive entries. Um, you can also see that when you consume from a Kinesis data stream, you're not deleting anything. 
which now means that you can start multiple different applications consuming from the same stream in like a fan out pattern and doing, doing all sorts of different types of analysis on the data stream. But again, as the number of shards grow and you perform these splits uh, of shards, the complexity of the code on the consumer increases because it's kind of on the client side code to keep track of who's reading from which shard, how far is it, and to checkpoint the progress of reading through it somewhere. And because of that, instead of using Kinesis APIs directly for consuming, I would recommend everyone to just use an existing client-side library called KCL Kinesis Client Library. It does all the complex management of shards, of uh, electing who's reading from which shard, of tracking progress of your reads, and you only focus on the actual code that processes the records from the stream. OK. Let's see how this behaves in a demo. So in the middle, we see a Kinesis data stream. And it has two shards. We start the first consumer. And because we can have multiple consumers reading from the same set of data, we identify consumers. This is application one that we'll be now consuming. And as the consumers start up, through Kinesis client library, they elect who's going to own which shard for consumption. So they have exclusive ownership of a particular shard in the stream. And we can see how both consumers ended up electing unique shards from the data stream. Let's start the first producer. And we can see how partition key A gets mapped through the hashing function to shard 0. And it's only the first uh, consumer that is seeing these messages. Starting the second producer, B hashes to shard 1. So the second consumer sees these entries. What that also means that because we have two shards, if we start the third consumer, he's not going to do anything because both shards already have exclusive owners. If we start the third producer, again, we have two shards. So the third consumer does nothing here. And the messages labeled C get appended to shard 0. And because we process the shard in sequence, we will start seeing messages labeled C when we reach A150 around that time. So let's stop the third consumer who's not doing any valuable work, and start him again, but identify him as a separate application. So this is application two. And let's start two consumers for application two. They also elect, oh, now we see, right? They started seeing uh, records labeled C in the first consumer. And application two elected who owns which shard, and consumes the same stream from the beginning, all the rows since the beginning. So we can see how it's kind of doing a fan out. One application does one thing on the stream, the other one does something else. And it processes things in sequence. But in order to scale consumers, you have to pre-shard things. If data is already in the stream and it was stored in five shards, that data can only be consumed by five consumers. Like, there's no way to speed it up in any way at that point. Like, it's kind of already too late. The data is assigned to shards already. So let's hear from Sid how the customer used Kinesis for the analysis. All right, so let's plug in Kinesis streams into an architecture. So all the Okta events were spread across multiple shards in a Kinesis stream. For the batch analysis, they were actually using a different flavor of Kinesis. It's called Kinesis Data Firehose, which lets you, in real time, push data to a storage service like S3. Once data made it to S3, then it was consumed into a Redshift cluster to do advanced SQL analysis. Now, for the alerts, they were actually triggering Lambda function when the data was written into S3. And this Lambda function was checking for specific attributes in the message, which was in S3, 
and sending notifications to end users if it was identified as an alert. Now let's talk about a final use case. Edmunds is a shopping website making car buying and selling extremely simple. They have a huge amount of used and new car listings by different car dealers, OEM franchisees. And when these entities make any changes or add new listings, that has to be updated to the Edmunds website. So they built a platform to make this happen. So let's look at their architecture. So these vendors were writing all the changes to source systems, and they wanted to decouple their source systems from their target systems using a messaging platform. These target systems were the backend of their website. Now let's look at the requirements. One is this entire pipeline, this entire platform has to be event-driven. That helps them save costs adds efficiency. The regular requirements from the message platform, durable, scalable, highly available. But in addition, they wanted the ability to write the same message to multiple target systems. So multiple consumers should receive the same message from the messaging platform. But in addition, they also wanted message filtering. So based on some message attributes, they can say only send this message to two systems or send this message to all the five systems. So they needed that flexibility. And all of this has to be done with minimal, minimal latency. So I'll let Kuba talk to us about the messaging platform. Thanks. So what's key here is that in their architecture, they wanted to send something and deliver to multiple destinations. And when we talk about this, uh, it's typically called the pub-sub model, where you publish something and you have multiple subscribers. And the way you achieve pub-sub in AWS like native messaging services is through SNS topics. So here's how we're gonna think about an SNS topic. Notice that there are no consumers on this image, and it's gonna be clear in a second why. Um, so this image represents a single SNS topic. Um, and what you can do with a topic is you can publish things to a topic, and you can configure subscriptions, destinations, to where the messages need to be delivered from a topic. So what, 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 what kind of destinations can you configure? One type of destination is an Amazon SQS queue. Uh, today, SNS uh, topics support SQS standard queues. They don't support uh, FIFO queues yet. So you use this type of destination for integrating systems together. The next one is Lambda. So you can easily hook up Lambda function as a destination of, of, of your SNS topic, which basically means that when you publish something, it's going to invoke a Lambda function for you. The third one is an HTTP endpoint. This is how you can achieve a push-based model for messaging. You implement a service, you expose an API, and you can configure SNS to invoke your API when a delivery needs to be made. And what's uh, really interesting here is that you can control the rate of retries, and basically, because SNS has, is very scalable, to prevent an outage of your system if there's a huge spike of invocations going through the HTTP delivery channel. And we also have different types of destinations typically geared more towards end users than system-to-system uh, -system integration, which is like mobile application push notifications, we've got SMS text messages, and we've got email also as a delivery target. What's new in Amazon SNS topics is you can also configure filters on each destination. So it's a simple function that can look at the attributes of your message and decide whether the message is allowed to be delivered to that destination or not. So let's see how it works. 
when you publish things to an SNS topic. Publisher calls, uh, producer calls publish, sending payload A, and immediately the message is stored durably in SNS across multiple availability zones. Uh, so, and immediately the producer is acknowledged that we got the message before we even attempt to start deliveries to all destinations. What this means is you will see the same low latency of publish invocations whether you have one destination or a million destinations on your SNS topic. The latency you observe on a publish is going to be the same. So what happens next is behind the scenes, you already saw an OK. From your point of view, the message is published. But now, internally inside SNS, we perform the fan out. So for each subscribed destination, we will end up sending a copy. In this example, we see how the filtering function, the second one, actually prevented the message from going out to this destination. And you can think about this stage as multiple internal queues inside SNS that you don't even see that keep track of each individual destination for you. So the fan out happened, and now we need to deliver five copies of these message to those different destinations. And behind the scenes, SNS now attempts the delivery. What happens if one of those channels fails for whatever reason? Let's say the reason is it was an HTTP endpoint and your web server was not running. What's going to happen is we will remember that those delivered notifications are already good, but we still keep track of the one that needs to be delivered to the endpoint that failed. And we will keep retrying. How many times? Depends on the destination. For all intents and purposes, when you subscribe an SQS queue or a Lambda function to an SNS topic, you can think of those retries as happening forever. Like, it's going to get delivered. For your own HTTP endpoints, you're in control of how many times the retry needs to be made, what's the back of retry time, and uh, basically at what rate the uh, retries happen and for how long. So when the second producer sends message to the topic, again, SNS sees the send attempt, stores it durably across multiple AZs, and confirms to the producer immediately that we got it. And the same situation happens again with a fan out. In this particular case, the first filtering function didn't allow the message through. The second allowed it through. And again, behind the scenes, a delivery attempt is made. And now one of these destinations actually have, has two messages to go through. So what's key here is that it's very elastic. Similar to standard SQS queues, it doesn't matter what your send, through, uh, send rate is. It can be 10 TPS, can be 10,000 cents per second. SNS topic will handle it. And the key here is you will always observe the same low publish latency because you're not waiting for the actual deliveries to happen. So it's a very nice integration platform where you just, you just call publish once, and all the different destinations configured on the topic get a copy of the message delivered. So let's hear from Sid how it solved the customer's problem. So Edmunds decided to use SNS with a fan out to multiple SQS queues for the architecture. Now we still have a server which is going to read from the SQS queues and then write it to the target systems. And we don't like servers, do we? So let's bring in our serverless champion, AWS Lambda. Now, SQS queue has native integration with AWS Lambda. What that means is that the AWS Lambda service does all the underlying heavy lifting, pulls the SQS queue, and invokes a Lambda function when it sees a message in the SQS queue. Additionally, it also takes care of scaling. So if the number of messages increases in the SQS queue, it will automatically increase the number of simultaneous Lambda invocations up to 1,000 simultaneous Lambda invocations. So now for this ar architecture, we can have different Lambda functions get triggered for different SQS queues. And these Lambda functions write data to different target systems. 
So let's plug this into our architecture. Perfect. Now one requirement still remains, that this entire architecture has to be event-driven. So for that, what admins did was they launched a Lambda function every time something was written to the source systems. This was a synchronous invocation, which basically went and wrote data to an Amazon S3 bucket. The Amazon S3 bucket was configured in such a way that a put event notification would automatically send a message to SNS. So we have, so we have that native integration between Amazon S3 and SNS. So let's recap. We saw Amazon SQS standard. The focus was simplicity. The producer writes a message to the queue. The receiver reads it, processes it, and then deletes it from the queue. And the queue by itself is literally infinitely scalable. One messages or a million messages, the queue adapts to the work, workload. But two things to consider. One, messages can be out of order. And two, you can have duplicate messages. Now, if your application cannot adapt to these characteristics, you can use SQS 5 queue, which guarantees in-order delivery of messages as well as only single message, so no duplicates. And you also have the flexibility of spreading your messages across multiple message groups. And within a given message group, you are guaranteed to have in-order processing of messages. We also have Kinesis, which is for streaming analysis of data. So you can go back in time and look at a bunch of messages together. You have the shard iterator through which you can control how back in time can you go. You can look from the latest records or go from the first record, as we saw in the demo. With Kinesis, the messages don't get deleted once it's processed. So they are there for the entire retention time. Additionally, in Kinesis, you can have multiple consumers read for the same message, as well as customer affinity. So you can have shards, and you can have one consumer read all the message of a shard, hence giving that consumer affinity. Finally, we saw Amazon SNS, which is a fan out kind of architecture, where you have one message which can be distributed and delivered to multiple endpoints. And we also have filtering inbuilt, so you don't have to send the same message to everyone. You can filter and put some kind of a logic when sending these messages. Thank you, and we'll take any, any questions you have now.